All right, uh, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 20. The Bible says in verse 1, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos came to him, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up into, unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. In this passage, King Hezekiah, the Bible says that he was sick unto death. And he was about to be taken home to be with the Lord until Hezekiah wept very sore and beseeched the Lord to remember all the good that he did for him. Because of that, the Lord decided to spare Hezekiah's life and he actually blessed him. He blessed him with 15 more years. He said that the Assyrians which were the enemies of the Jews that time, that they wouldn't bother him. And all his days would be peace and prosperity. And Isaiah was able to heal Hezekiah of his sickness and his ailment. And Hezekiah was able to reign prosperously, peacefully, with the blessing of God for the rest of his life. Because he made a difference by weeping sore and praying to God. Now, this sounds like a wonderful, positive thing if you were to hear God say to you, tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days 15 years I will deliver thee out of the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servants David's sake. I mean, if you hear something like that, it's something positive. You would think it's from God. And that's a wonderful thing. Except, except that we know the consequence of what happened after that was that he had a son named Manasseh born. And Manasseh, the Bible says, was worse than all the kings, the Jewish kings combined. Worse than King Ahab. Would you imagine that? God said that, I will bless you, I'll take care of your life, and then it turned out that your child would be the worst sinner more than any other sinner we ever had in this country. I mean, that's a horrible thing that happened. All because... God blessed Hezekiah's prayer. And because of that, he had a tragic consequence like that. What if at verse 1, what if at verse 1 and 2, he did not weep sore? What if at verse 1 and 2, he accepted what God told him to do? Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Manasseh would never be born. Hezekiah would never have that heartache of a son who would be worse than all the Jewish kings combined before him, Hezekiah would probably have a chance with his kingdom and Judah. And the Bible says that the southern kingdom, Judah, God's judgment was imminent and sure because of Manasseh. I mean, even at the time when Judah, the nation, was right with God and doing things for the Lord, God said in his scripture that judgment was still coming because of what Manasseh did. But maybe that would have changed for the nation of Judah. Maybe they would have had a better chance if Manasseh never existed. If God never blessed Hezekiah's prayer, 
if Hezekiah did not weep sore and beg God to change something. You know, the Bible talks about weeping sore, right? Didn't you know that that's synonymous with other verses in the Bible? He wept bitterly. He wept sore, matching with he wept bitterly. And there are times in your life when you are sick and you are dying, and then God tells you, set your house in order. You're going to die. You're not going to live. Instead of accepting it, setting our house in order, we weep very bitterly, don't we? And we beg God, Lord, I mean, remember all the good that I've done for you, Lord, this is not fair. There's got to be a better way. Do you react like that when you're dying? When you're in your sick bed? Everybody is going through death. Every say believer goes through death. Paul said, I die daily. And as we are dying, the tendency is, Lord, take it away. But God, he wants to keep that in your life because it is for the better. But if you come out of that, if you bypass that, you could be headed for something worse. Worse than you would expect. And you might see nothing bad with it. You might see something positive. God blessed you. He said, I will add you 15 years. I will defend this city for my namesake, for David, my servant. You are Hezekiah, the captain of my people. When you hear all that, there's nothing negative. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, it may not be bad to you, but, and you might see that as God's blessing, but, it could be a worse thing. It could be a worse thing. We will talk about these things as we continually read the scriptures. Will you all pray with me? Father God, will you feel within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood? Make today's preaching a blessing to your people. Convict us, change our lives, open our eyes to some things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 1 will be the standard verse that I will constantly compare as we look at the entire chapter. Very powerful here. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet the Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And when God is visiting you on your sick bed and you are dying that is your opportunity as your flesh is dying to be crucified with Christ that is a time when God says set your house in order and as you do that the reaction of believers is not to set our house in order but rather in verse 2 face to the wall prayed unto the Lord, and verse 3, wept bitterly. We come bitter. We become deep in grief. We always find things to complain and whine about and then think, poor me, woe is me, the devil's attacking me, God's trying me, and this is so difficult. The reaction in our lives is bitterness. It's being sore with grief rather than, verse 1, Doing what God commanded. Set thine house in order. You know one thing I learned about when I die, as I lay dying in my sick bed? That's a time that I've got to get a grip on myself and set my house in order. That is the perfect time that I get away from the world Get away from good health where I'm preoccupied with the things that I'm always doing in my flesh. But to lay down in bed, die, die, die doing nothing. And finally get a good deep reflection in my own life. Look at everything in my house and see what's not in order. And then I realize, wow, Lord, uh, I got a patience problem here, don't I? 
I can be very impatient. But see, I didn't see that before because I was preoccupied with the things of this world, with job, busyness, and ministry, 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 of course. But when God afflicts your life and you're laying on your deathbed, he tells you, set your house in order. And do you set your house in order or do you turn your face to the wall? And we bitterly, and you're in grief, and you oh, woe is me. God, please know this. Hey, get your face away from the wall. Stop weeping bitterly and look at your own house. And don't you think, don't you see that things are out of order? So many things out of order in your life. For one, your relationship with God is not good. And that's a good time that you start making time and start reflecting on what you need to read in that book. What you need to finally pray over because your relationship with God was not good all that time. And I don't care how many souls you want to Jesus Christ. And I don't care how long you pastor a church. And I don't care how long uh, you are with relationships and good you are with relationships with your family, with other people around you in the ministry. I mean... Woe is you if you have good relationships with them, but not with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's a good time that you get that house in order. You know why? Because the house is you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And here you are, your spiritual nature is crying. It's a baby. It's starving. Feed me. I need God's word. I need to to God and pray and you aren't doing anything about it and your house is falling apart and that's why as you live your life every day you feel like you're falling apart you know why you didn't set your house in order first you didn't get your walk with Jesus Christ fixed first and if you were to fix that then as you go out in your workplace as you go through trials get involved in this church work, you'll see a change and you'll see more strength and help and God moving. But you're not doing that, are you? Everybody's living life every day, going to work, driving through traffic, helping out church, signing up volunteer sheets, doing the same old, same old, without their house set in order, without their relationship and walk with Jesus Christ fixed first. How's uh, your spiritual walk with Jesus Christ? Oh, what about the sins that you're messing around with, huh? And you think that you can keep coming to church, win a whole bunch of souls and serve Jesus Christ, bring him glory and be a good testimony with those sins you're still messing around with in your life? You know why God afflicts you? Make you think about your sins, some things that need to be chastened. The blueness of a wound cleanses away evil, the Bible says. And he starts to afflict your life and then you see some things that you've been messing around with and sins that you also did not see before. And God says, see this? You still got pride issues. You're a stubborn person. See this? You got uh, fear, worry issues. You get discouraged easily. You got a victimization mentality all the time. Here you are complaining and whining when I'm good to you. See that, child? We need to fix this problem first. You need to surrender these sins to me. You need to plead the blood of Jesus Christ. You need to repent so that I can use you ahead in the future. But here you are. You ignore your defects. You complain about the affliction and trial you're going through, and then after that, you just move on with life. Here you got impatience issues, temper issues, pride issues, still some problems between you and the brethren. There's no unity in there, and you won't clean that up. And you think you can keep going on serving God with that mess in your heart and in your mind? Try to carry that bitterness as you keep serving God in church. You won't last long. You know what you need to do? Listen, not get so busy with church work and serving God. You need to set your house in order first. You need to surrender your heart to God. You need to repent. You need to reflect on some things because your house is not in order. And there are 
psychologists and therapists who even agree you can't even live and work life effectively if your mental stability is messed up, if your mental health is not good, if your well-being is not good. You know why a lot of rich people pay a lot of money for therapy? Because they don't go God's way and they know how important it is to have the mental stability a good well-being so that they can do high performance level work that they've been doing to manage all the stressful things that are going on in their lives. How can you feel like you can keep going on, keep coming to this church, keep serving God, doing the things that you're doing for the Lord when your heart is not at peace with God, when your house is not in order, when your house is divided and falling apart Jesus said, when a man builds his house on a rock, then no matter what storm goes through, that house will stand. And he can continue the work of the Lord because it's founded on a rock. But then there are people who build their house on sand, Jesus says. And because it's built on sinking sand, it's only a matter of time when some one little wave, one little storm of life, one little trial, one little test from God, and your whole house falls apart. Is that how your service for God is? Are you falling apart? Then there's something there in your foundation of your house that's not set in order. It's on sinking sand, isn't it? Or is it built on a rock? You know, uh, people know how busy I am, and I'm crazy busy. But I've learned that I can't use those things as my excuse, and I've got to have a firm foundation first. Until I have a conviction, until the Lord shows me something and I have a principle and a practice and a change in my life that I know is firm like a rock, like a rock that cannot be moved, then I can continue on with my job. Otherwise, I will never catch up with my work. Otherwise, I will not be able to complete my work well. Otherwise, listen, I can't preach to you this message well today until I get my heart settled with God first. Set your house in order. Look at your own house, physical house. Is it in order? People not getting along with their spouses and their children and the excuses is that, well, they don't listen to me. Where they're lost, they're unbelievers, they're messed up in sin, they're this and they're that. You know, a lot of times when people talk like that, they don't look at themselves. And maybe if you love them like you're supposed to love them in Jesus Christ, then they might witness something in you that you care about them, and that might convict them, and they just might listen to you one day. I'll tell you one thing, a wife or a woman ain't going to listen to you if she thinks that you don't love her. But if you love her and that shows, then she will obey you better. You want your kids to listen to you? Then when you discipline them, do they see that as just mere discipline or because you genuinely love them? We think about that. Problem is we're so caught up in discipline and in obedience and what we're supposed to do that we don't show the love. We don't let them know that they, that there is love in this, and that's why they don't change. They become bitter. They don't listen to you. Do they know that you love them? That's why you're doing that? Or is it just flesh, anger? And they ain't going to listen to you. No wonder your house ain't in order. Wives, you know why your children ain't listening to you? Because they keep looking at you, disobeying the husband. They learn from you. You know why fathers, the wives won't listen to you? Because you don't love them where they can trust you enough and then obey you. And guess what? Your kids are doing the same thing too. Your house is a mess and you think that you can come to here in church and expect to serve God and God do great things and fill up every seat in the pew and souls get saved and people around the world know about us. How can God do that if your house ain't in order yet? Look at your physical house. It's a wreck. You haven't been praying for your family. 
You don't spend time with the Lord in your relationship. That's why your kids don't spend time in reading the Bible and praying to the Lord. You know, they see you come to church, living clean, doing things for God, merely as a duty, not because you got the joy of the Lord in there. Not because it's genuine and real. And nobody wants what you got. I don't care how Christian it is. Nobody wants what you got if it ain't real to you. If it ain't a joy to you. If it's like, oh man, it's hard. I got to get to church. Then what do you think your kids are going to think? Oh, it's so hard to go to church. Why not? I can't wait to go to church. That preacher's going to preach something. And then you'll see your kids motivated. When parents get hungry for the word of God, then their kids are going to get hungry. But every time they see you tired, depressed, and complaining, your kids keep seeing that, and they think that's what Christianity is. Set your house in order. Your house is a mess. I don't care how unbelieving or how wicked they are. They're going to remember your joy in the Lord. How much church meant to you, Jesus meant to you, staying away from sin is a pure joy in your life. And doing things for the Lord is the greatest thing. They will re forever remember that no matter how far they go astray. And then when they try every sin and wickedness and their decisions in life, because they remember you love them, and because they see you got the realness and the joy of Jesus Christ, they're going to be attracted to eventually go back there. And the reason why they're not back is because you failed the love toward them and you failed to show the joy of the Lord. They just see you complaining about hardship and suffering, how unfair life is and how hard it is to serve Jesus Christ. And they won't want to come back to that. Set your house in order. How can we move on in the ministry if this church is not set in order? If God lives inside our house, and when believers assemble together, that is the house of God, not a building. Is this house set in order? You think we can resume with our renovations? You think we can continue the blowout? You think that we can pursue great things for Jesus Christ? Pastors got great ideas, and we're going to do great things. How can God bless it? How can God honor it if there are things in this church that are not set in order? People not coming to church. People not volunteering. People not having a desire to win souls for Jesus Christ because that's the other jo brother's job. That's the sister's job. It's not my own thing. When you have sand in the middle of a rock, that rock, because it's built on sand, will still fall. It's got to be rock and firm a foundation and then God can keep building up this church. No, you haven't been praying for the people who need prayer. You haven't been fellowshipping with the people who need fellowship. You know, I know that they got issues, they got to work on it, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 that the weaker parts of the body, we're supposed to give more abundant honor. You doing that? That's why the house is not set in order. That's the reason why this church is going to fall apart. And then when numbers dwindle down more in our seats and then soul winning becomes colder and colder and tracks are becoming more ineffective, then it will eventually affect the preaching and this preaching will have no effect on you. On, Why? Because the house is not set in order. Preach, Come on. You feel like you're dying? Is this church dying? Are we dying right now? That's the time to... Set your house in order, not weep against the wall and go, people are leaving our church because California is so tough. And God, you put us in an unfair situation. And Lord, it's so difficult. And Lord, if you gave us more money, this would be possible. More resources, if this would be more possible. More members in our church, this would be more pass possible. People in Sacramento to be close to us, we'd be close to them. The people in the Bay Area all be close to this church. Why do we have to have a church in this city? Can it be in a more easier city? And then we have to pay the toll road, people driving three and a half hours. You're going to weep bitterly all day long facing against the wall or are you going to get up and do something about it and set your house in order? It's time to get back in that book on your knees. It's time to get rid of those sins out of your life. 
It's time to look at your own house and start cleaning house and manifest the love of Jesus Christ like you're supposed to and act the discipline in love like you're supposed to and show the real genuine joy of the Lord like you're supposed to. And fix your house. Fix your relationships in the marriage with your children. Fix your relationship in this church with your brothers and sisters in Christ. With your involvement, your personal work in this church, it's time to fix house. And then maybe God can move and do something. But we just get people who are just turning against the wall and weeping, weeping, weeping bitterly. You feeling the bitterness right now? Are you feeling sore? Then it's time to set your house in order. In verse 4, 5, and 6, the Bible says, It came to pass a fourth time, before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day. Thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. <laughs> Nothing negative here, right? Like I mentioned before. This sounds like a blessing from God. What a great blessing it was to Hezekiah. But what was a blessing to Hezekiah? And what was a blessing to him for the rest of his life? No pain. No sorrow. This is not negative. This is purely a blessing from God upon Hezekiah's life. God was merciful to him. He was gracious. He said, okay, Hezekiah, you can't handle it. You're weeping in bitterness. So let me finally answer your prayer. Let me free you from that problem. If you want me to heal your health, that's fine. I will heal you. If you want me to send more people in this church, fine. I will send them. If you need this prayer to be answered so that you can do more things for me, I get it. I'll do it. And that became a blessing to you. And you're thanking the Lord. And you are genuinely serving him. You are working harder than ever before because God's been good to you. But what's a blessing to you will not be a blessing to the people around you. Why? Because uh, he had a son named Manasseh. You know, I always wondered, how did Manasseh become so messed up? If you look at chapter 21, verse 1, 21, verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. Now look, if he had a good mother, good father, which I'm pretty sure he did, how can at 12 years old, in verse 2, you do evil? That don't make sense, right? When you become a teenager, I get it, okay? But why at 12? 12. Twelve, you're strongly influenced with godly principles. You would tend to keep things that way. And how did a 12-year-old, listen, how did a 12-year-old become more wicked than any other lost people in his region? Don't make sense. His mother's name was Hephzibah, so I was guessing maybe it's because he had an evil mom. But uh, when I looked up historical sources on Hephzibah, most of it was positive. I'm not sure if it's true, but some claim Hephzibah was Isaiah's daughter. I don't know if that's true or not. So I don't think that it's because he had evil influence around him. He had good godly influence. What does his name mean, right? So then I looked up the name. The name means uh, God hath made me forget. So if you look back at Genesis, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh because Joseph said, God made me forget all the trial, all the suffering that I went through. He blessed me too much. So I'm like, hmm, maybe there might be something there. Then I looked up every child of godly kings did you notice that it's pretty strange majority of the kids growing up in king's home, when you look at the Bible, they ended up being wicked? 
forsaking the Lord, not following the God of their fathers. David was a man after God's own heart, but he had sons who committed incest in the house. It didn't make sense. So, when I kept looking up judges, it's the same thing with Samuel. Samuel was a godly man, but his boys didn't live right for God. And I was like, huh, I wonder if there's a pattern here. And usually, listen, a lot of leaders that God has used, you'd be surprised how many of their kids end up rotten. Do you know why? They're sick and tired of that spiritual upbringing. And children, sometimes they want to be the opposite of what their parents do. Parents will tell them, do this, and the child, what would he or she want to do? <laughs> the opposite, right? It would make sense if Manasseh was so bitter, so rebellious against his parents, because his parents were so strong in upbringing that he wanted to totally rebel by doing the most evil things than any other king. Here's another one. Why do I see second generation Christians falling away into the world, but first generation Christians who live more spiritually than second generation sometimes? Do you know why? First generation tasted sin already, and they don't want to mess with that. So then that's why they live so clean. Second generation never tasted sin. They're too blessed by God. God made them forget the suffering and consequences of sin because they never tasted it. And when there's no suffering but only the blessing of God on that child's life, they tend to grow up spoiled, they tend to covet the world, and they turn total rebellion and do the worst evil against God. You know when Manasseh repented? When God afflicted him. When God made him suffer. And the Bible said Manasseh repented and he knew, he realized the Lord is God. Why didn't you recognize that when you were young? You know why? He was not afflicted. He was blessed. Why was he blessed? Because God answered Hezekiah's prayer. No pain, no suffering, please. Bless me. You know why pain is good? Pain is good. Suffering is good. God hath made me forget my suffering. Praise the Lord for that, but there's a price to pay. When you don't have any idea about suffering, you tend to go after the things of the world. But when you remember suffering, when you remember suffering, keeps you humble, makes you remember how wicked sin is, keeps you clean. So you don't want suffering? You want God to answer your prayer? You know one thing? I am so scared to forget all that suffering. Amen. I have a personal conviction in going to missions trip every year now after that last trip. You know why? I cannot forget what it's like over there. Those struggles, uh, the things that you have to go through in the third world countries, I need that. Yeah. That way when I come back here, I don't forget and it helps me set my house in order when I pastor. But if you keep living in this comfortable country, America, what's going to happen to you? You don't know what suffering is. Oh, I'm suffering. You don't know what suffering is. You need it. You need suffering. You need stop putting your face against the wall and weeping bitterly. Set your house in order by taking the suffering, accepting it, and using it for the glory of God. Because if you don't, you might be blessed in your life, but the other people around you won't. You know what happened to Hezekiah's boy? He wasn't blessed from Hezekiah's blessing. It was more of a detriment to him. Hezekiah's blessing wasn't really a blessing to his nation. His blessing of living longer doomed his country, his kingdom, with the birth of Manasseh. But 
if Hezekiah accepted suffering, then what would he do? If he was like Paul, when he besought the Lord thrice, take away this suffering from me, and God said, no, because my grace is sufficient for thee. If Hezekiah <coughs> accepted that suffering like the apostle Paul, then he could say, like 2 Corinthians 1, whether we are suffer or we are afflicted, it is for your consolation. What did that mean? His affliction was a blessing to somebody else. But if Paul had no suffering, he cannot bless somebody else. He could become like maybe Hezekiah, who is too blessed and then becomes a detriment to other people. God, why is our church dying? Haven't we done enough? Why can't you bless us? Maybe because he doesn't want you to forget this. Maybe he doesn't want you to forget where you came from. Maybe he wants you to keep you good and clean because God knows his every seat is filled in here. God blessed us too much. God knows what's going to happen to you and me. What God knows what's going to happen to the kids we raise here. Make them grow up like Manasseh, maybe. Oh, if they had more kids in this church than my kid could live right. If I had more people in this church than I could live right. If God blessed us more resources, money, that. How do you know? Could, could be a detriment. Do you know how many large Bible-believing churches I know of where they get people getting out like that and becoming spoiled and prodigal? Just because you have every resource in the church in the world doesn't mean that you're going to keep them in the straight and narrow for God. You know what's going to keep them in the straight and narrow for God? Get your stinking house in order. And listen, no matter how wicked this place becomes or California gets, your kids and you will still stay right with God. Ain't that encouraging? No, we don't need more resources. We don't need more people. We don't need more money. We don't need to be in a better place or better area. We need God. And that's what is missing in our house. Our house is not in order because we're just not right with God. When we uh, look at verse 7, And Isaiah said, take a lump of figs, and they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. <coughs> so God hears Hezekiah's bitterness. God, I want to be blessed. I don't want this suffering and affliction so that I could do more for you. So God is merciful, gracious to Hezekiah. He is good to him. He blesses him beyond his expectation. And he calls on Isaiah the prophet, I want you to take a lump of figs. And then either Hezekiah, maybe he sniffed it, maybe he ate it, I don't know what. But whatever it did, that lump of figs, he was able to recover from it. God allowed a lump of figs to recover Hezekiah. Ain't that strange? Usually in the Bible, a lump is not a good thing. The Bible says a little leaven leaveneth the what? Whole lump. Figs is not really that good either in the Bible, too. Sometimes it has positive reference, don't get me wrong. But what do figs represent? Self-righteousness. But God, listen, God nevertheless used a lump, which pictures sin. God nevertheless allowed figs, which represents self-righteousness, to recover Hezekiah. He allows it. You know, when you're weeping bitterly and you want to be recovered, but God shows you those inward parts of you in your house that needs to be fixed, that needs to be set in order, but you don't want to fix it. You just want to be healed. Then you know what God's going to do? He will allow you to keep that lump that you didn't fix. He will allow you to keep your figs 
that you didn't fix and use those things to recover you. How often have we passed through our suffering and affliction hanging on to our own self-righteousness and those sinful imperfections that we never got victory over? How many times have we recovered from the suffering with our lump of figs? You know what's going to happen? If you keep that lump, if you keep that figs, open up to temptation. That's what's going to happen. You're going to mess up. Didn't you know that's, that's what happened to Hezekiah? Well, let's keep reading here. That's one thing that's going to happen is that you're going to recover with your lump and figs. With your sinful imperfection, you didn't clean up, you didn't get right with God yet, and your self-righteousness. That's the first thing that's going to happen. The second thing that's going to happen, look at this, this is dangerous. And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, we're at verse 8, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up unto the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees, or go back ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backward ten degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. What a miracle of God! Hezekiah, he was a Jew. So he had the right to require a sign. And Hezekiah said, I need a sign from God that this healing is from him. And Isaiah said, then, should the, their clock that time was a dial. I'm sure all of you know that. So then, depending on how the sun shone on that dial, wherever the shadow moved, then it showed the time. And then he said, shall the shadow go forward or backwards? Well, forward means nothing. So King Hezekiah said, I want it to turn backwards. So basically, Hezekiah was asking, turn the clock backwards. 10, 15 minutes. Not 10, 15 minutes forward because that's not something special. So God did that. And because God did that, that sign confirmed God's healing on Hezekiah. And Hezekiah had a sign, a confirmation from God that what he had, the healing is of the Lord. And you know why that can be dangerous? Because when God heals your life, you know God is very good to you. And when he heals your life because you wept bitterly and you're begging God and you just want to get out of the affliction and you don't get your house in order first, and you just weep and pray bitterly for God to heal, you know what God does? He heals you, and guess what? He blesses you, and He gives you fruits to confirm His work upon your life. And signs is another word for fruit. Hezekiah wants a sign. I want the signs, basically the evidence of God's work. When we Christians say, I want the fruits of God's work, I want evidence, the signs of God's work. So when God blesses our church with more people or so many souls get saved and then uh, we see how people love the Lord Jesus Christ and how God is providing you financially and you got so much money, God gave you a nice home, don't we often say praise the Lord and thank you God and take those things as basically signs, fruits, that God is blessing what I'm doing. You know what that dangerous thing is? Listen, I know this speaking as a pastor. It's a dangerous thing when Bible-believing pastors, because they keep seeing fruits in their church, they think that the way they're pastoring is right with God. Then you know what that is? That's a competition of fruits showing whose ministry is better and who's really doing the work of the Lord. That's dangerous. 
But I also want to add this. You Christians are in danger land too, in a dangerous zone as well, because God keeps blessing what you're doing for him, and that's why you think that you're okay with God, you're right with God. There's no, nothing in your house that needs to be set in order. Because God's blessing me, so I must be right with God. Let me tell you something. It's called God's mercy and grace, not your self-righteousness. You little fig, you. You got your figs in you. And you use those figs to think that because there's something good about you that God's going to bless your life. That's what Hezekiah did. You know that? You know, how, you know what he did when he wept bitterly against the wall? I'll tell you why he weeps bitterly against the wall. Verse 3. This is what Hezekiah said. I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now, I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. He thinks he's got a perfect heart. Oh, let's see, Hezekiah. You got a perfect heart? You got a perfect heart? Let's see. Verse 12. <clears throat> At that time, Barodek, Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick, and Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then, Hezek uh, then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hez Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Okay, what happened was this. After Hezekiah was healed, there are some people from Babylon who came to visit Hezekiah's kingdom. And he made the stupid mistake of showing everything in his kingdom to the Babylonians. Now that's a real dumb move. No one in any country is going to do that. You're not going to show off all your military secrets to an enemy country, to a foreign country. You ain't going to do that. But why did Hezekiah do that? Showing off. What was that? Pride. Where does pride come from? It can come from, oh, self-righteousness. He had a perfect heart. Let's see. Second Chronicles. You know what God said? Okay, you got a perfect heart. Hezekiah, you said that? Let's see here. So he allowed the Babylonians to come to Hezekiah. Why? Because of chapter 32. <clears throat> chapter 32. Verse 31. Verse 31. So God says, okay, Hezekiah, you wept bitterly. You said you had a perfect heart. Let's see. So he sends over those Babylonians to test Hezekiah's heart, if it's really perfect. 2 Chronicles 32, 31. Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon. Remember that? Who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. God left him to what? Try him that he might know all that was in his heart. God, remember, I had a perfect heart with you and this is just wrong and Lord, I learned my lesson and you can take away the affliction. Get your house in order. I did God and I tried and... All right, fine. Then he blesses you. And when he blesses you, you got a perfect heart? No, there's that little self-righteousness in there. There's that lump in there. That's not been purified. And God's going to let the blessing happen to you to test, listen, to test, to test your heart. Okay, you said that you got no lump, you got no things, you got a perfect heart. Let's see what happened when I get rid of this affliction and bless your life and answer your prayer. Did it the way that you want because you're so much in bitterness and in grief. Guess what happens to you, buddy? You fall into pride, don't you? 
and you think that you're somebody special. You're very spiritual. God blessed your life. But, 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 but you're a humble Bible believer, so I'm not saying that you think you're very special, but you think you're more spiritual than that particular brother and sister in the room. And that pastor is a good man, but he's just wrong on that one. And then when that sets in, because God blessed this church too much, God blessed your life too much, God tested your heart, and you fell to the enemy. You know one thing I notice about God's blessing on churches? There's still there's splits that happen. You ever wondered why? People are in the flesh. They didn't get their house in order yet. Because all the experience is God's blessings, God's blessing, God's blessing. God hath made me forget. My, God hath made me forget my affliction, and because of that, they got that lump that they didn't fix, that fig they didn't fix, which was impatience, lack of understanding, easy to get annoyed, thinking how people are so stupid. Why can they do that? And that person's wicked and a sinner and. I know I'm supposed to love him or her, but I just can't stand it. See that? And there's covetousness, envy, and when you get that, friend, when God blesses his church a lot, we're asking, we're asking for church splits to happen. To my knowledge, so far, we didn't have a split, praise the Lord. Maybe it's because God didn't fill up every seat yet and maybe because God kept us to the size that he thought was best because maybe he keeps afflicting us and will not leave us alone because we're all just trying to work it out and getting our house in order aren't we now when we go back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 16, verse 16. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord, and of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now look at this. This is a negative thing. This is a negative thing. Hezekiah, what did he do? You know what his response was in verse 19? He did not turn his face to the wall or weep bitterly. You notice that? He surrendered. He said in verse 19, then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? He finally surrendered. He didn't turn his face to the wall and weep. He surrendered. You know why? Because the imperfection in his heart was finally exposed. And he realized what was good for him, what he deserved. But if you go back to verse 1, see, go back to verse 1, he didn't see the imperfections in his heart and he didn't think he deserved this. He didn't deserve to die. If you go back to verse 1 through 3, he didn't think he had imperfections in his heart. But in this case, because of the imperfections in his heart from the Babylonians, Hezekiah was like an eye-opener. He realized what he'd done was so stupid. Nobody in their right mind would do it, but he did. And that made him finally surrender to God's affliction. Now, his statement is, you can see something good out of that. Good is the word of the Lord. But it's still not really good. It says, is it not good if there be peace in my days, he says. Well, yeah, but that's like Chamberlain who waved a paper of a peace treaty and that peace treaty meant nothing. In other words, Hezekiah's kingdom was still going to fall eventually. He only bought a temporary peace. He could have gotten, listen, he may have gotten full peace. 
He may have gotten full peace if he did, if he surrendered to the word of the Lord and said, good is the word of the Lord, back at verse 1. Not at verse 25 or verse 30, 32 and verse 40 and 60 and 125 like some of you are doing. If he just started at verse 1, set your house in order. You're dying and you need to die. Amen. You know what Gene Kim needs to do? He must die. I die daily. I must die. I need to get out of the way so that God can move in and then do something in my life and I need to say good is the word of the Lord. You know, one thing I've seen from here is that I can either take God's testing during my affliction or I can take God's testing during my blessing. Usually in blessings, you don't see your imperfection because God keeps blessing you and keeps giving you sign after sign Fruit, fruit, fruit. So you think you're right with God and there are just some prideful, stupid Bible believers out there who think they're right with God because they keep looking at their signs and their fruits. And they didn't get their house in order at the beginning. Do you know how many advanced Bible believers out there need to go back to the basics? They're still sucking on their thumbs and they don't get it. Do you know how many times God had to drag me back to the basement and not on the rooftop. God had to drag me at the bottom of the foundation and not the top of the ceiling. Everybody wants to be at the top of the ceiling. Look at the beautiful things and the beautiful view and get everything great. They don't want to work at the bottom because it's just ugly down there and you want to get out of it. But you need to get in there and set and fix that basement first because your house is falling apart, ain't it? If none of you can say here today, I have 100% joy in Jesus Christ. I have 100% peace. I have 100% satisfaction. Then there's something in your house not in order. It would have been best that you've done it at the beginning, not now. You might say, good is the word of the Lord. All right, Lord, thank you so much for the good times and the bad. Thank you, God, for chastising me. And we got people saying that. Praise the Lord for that. But wouldn't it be a lot better rather than being encouraged with Romans 8, 28 with all the stupid mistakes that we did that we have zero regrets rather than having regrets while claiming Romans 8, 28? What, having regrets while saying good is the word of the Lord? Having regrets while saying, Lord, thank you for your chastisement because I needed it, I deserved it. It would have been better if it didn't even happen to begin with, if you surrendered all the way at the beginning. Good is the word of the Lord no matter what we go through in life. Because, man, praise the Lord Jesus Christ that he can turn our bad into good. Man, I, it, it makes me happy. But won't it make me happier if I never really had to do that as much? God really had to take the bad, stupid mistakes that I did and turn it for good. If that was even less, wouldn't, that, wouldn't I be happier that way? Because no matter how much you claim Romans 8, 28, regret is still there. And I'm pretty sure that the majority of you, that there are some stupid things you did in your life or still doing now, that you want to change or take back. But didn't God Romans 8.28 it? Yeah, he Romans 8.28 it, but that don't mean that you don't want to go back there and change some stupid things that you did, some stupid things you said, some stupid things that you did, some stupid decisions that you shouldn't have decided on. No one wants to have regrets. That's why, why not... Surrender to God at verse 1 today. 
and to have no regrets. Can you imagine that kind of a life of no regrets? Do you understand what I'm talking about here? Imagine a life free from regrets. Not thinking about the stupid mistakes you did in your past, but thinking about those sufferings that God pulled you through and how he taught you so many things and how he was gentle with you and helped you and gave you grace and then how God made you a better person out of that. Wouldn't that be something that you want to live your whole life in? And as you lay dying on your deathbed, to have no regrets would be one of the most blessed things. Why does everybody have to worry about the judgment seat of Christ when they lay on their deathbed? Because you got regrets, don't you? You and I got plenty of regrets. Let's not build it up more. I think we can make it less today. Let's go back to verse 1, shall we? Every head bow and every eye shut. 